Um, a good example of that is Mahonia, which is a really common garden plant. It's the kind of thing you see in Sainsbury's car parks and in council roundabouts. It's on flower at the moment. Those kind of uh, holly-like leaves and kind of yellow, orange blossom scented flowers. It's been used to treat MRSA, uh, not only MRSA, but lots of types of uh, drug resistant bacteria. Bacteria, in some substances, um, evolve a pump. When they're in, a, in an environment where they're constantly exposed to a toxin like an antibiotic and penicillin, they evolve what's called, I think it's a protein pump. But basically, you get all this toxin going to your body, it's basically a detox pump. It kind of sends it all out and gets rid of it so the bacteria are quite happy. Now, Mahonia is really interesting because not only contains antibacterial agents, it also contains an agent that blocks this pump. So these bacteria that penicillin can't treat can suddenly, with Mahonia, the hope is, be able to find some kind of solution. The other one is HCI. Uh, it sounds really exotic and, and complicated. It stands for Cutinia Cordata, or Cutinia, I can never pronounce it, Cordata Injection. Uh, anyone heard of Cutinia Cordata? Where have you heard it from? Yeah. Oh, anyone? <laughs> Lady the Pink. Oh, that's, that's unfair. Lady the <laughs> Match fixing. It's a really common garden plant in this country. In Asia, uh, my grandma knows it as laksa leaf. You use it to set laksa, that, that soup, that spicy, coconutty based soup. It's basically a really common medicinal and edible plant in Asia. Weirdly, it gets brought over here and it's because it's kind of pretty. People think, oh, pretty plant, put it in a, in a bog garden, which is lovely, but it just has all these other uses. Now, it's been used as one of the key plants in traditional Chinese medicine. And when SARS first came around, there was a huge panic because a lot of the conventional medicine just wasn't working. So, the quite progressive Chinese government, in some senses, looked at uh, basically a big sort of a assessment of all the traditional plants that have been used for similar conditions. And it found, out of 5,000 plants, 25 were effective, or relatively effective, and only one was really exciting, and that's Hutinia cordata. And Hutinia cordata injection is basically a liquid made out of this, I think it's as simple as an infusion, but don't quote me on that, injected. And uh, it's the key reason, or the, the Chinese government's key weapon against SARS. And you could maybe even go and say, as far as it's probably the reason why SARS isn't such an issue and why the pandemic was able to be curbed. I'm not an epidemiologist, but that's my personal thing. It could be. Um, another thing is, if you're a tabloid reader, you'll have heard of Tamiflu. Um, you, you'll also have heard it's used to treat things like swine flu and bird flu. It's an antiviral drug. Um, what you probably don't know is that it's usually produced from star anise. If you go into Tesco's or, or any other supermarket and you're a, you know, a fan of exotic cooking like I am, you'll have found that the price of star anise has gone up by about 1,000%, depending on which month you're talking about, in the last 12 months. Mm -hmm. And the reason is there's a big uh, fear about swine flu. Swine flu comes pretty much only, there are other sources as well, synthetic sources, but key still from star anise. And world production can't ramp up the second the disease hits. You've got a fixed amount. So uh, Roche, the pharmaceutical company who makes Tamiflu, have bought up 90% of the world's supply. And um, that's why there's a bit of a panic, and that's why the price is going up. There are companies that are trying to isolate it from Christmas trees as well, incidentally. Uh, I'm making a series called Growing on Christmas, so that's the only reason why I know that. But apparently, um, there is, how's that for a plug? Uh, there is uh, companies in Canada that are recycling Christmas trees and stockpiling them as a potential hope for the next Tamiflu group, or the next source of Tamiflu. And the other one, which was featured, and did anyone see that program, um, Medicine Men Go Wild? Yeah. All right, okay. Well, there was a, there was a program, a bit like Tribe, that took, took two doctors and sent them out to the Amazon and different parts of the world, and they looked at traditional medicine. And some of it was quite objective, and some of it was a little bit they're just doing rubbish, this is ridiculous. And one of the cases, there was a child with malaria, and they said, you know, this traditional medicine is clearly not working, it's absolutely ridiculous, it's time to step in, uh, you know, we're men of science, we're going to treat this child. The drug they gave them was um, quite recently discovered, actually, or quite recently produced, and it comes from wormwood. Uh, originally comes from traditional Chinese medicine with uh, thousands of years of history, and when the first Chinese scientists tried to introduce it to Western science, basically no one believed them for a very long time, Primarily, they say, because they were Chinese. Um, it's now one of the most important anti-malarial drugs, particularly in areas like Southeast Asia, and it treats drug-resistant malaria. So it's not just old, dusty stuff, it's new stuff as well, and it's in quite a large percentage of our medicine. 
So if you think about it this way, like that big black line we had earlier that separates herbal medicine from conventional medicine, I know that sounds really complex, but it's quite easy to reduce down. Uh, anyone heard of ayahuasca? I'm sure some eaten people have. Um, ayahuasca is a hallucinogenic ritual drug taken in large parts of Latin America. Um, it's basically a mix of different substances here. Uh, if you test ayahuasca weirdly, you'll find that there are no hallucinogenic substances in it, which is strange. Um, it does contain DMT, which is a powerful hallucinogen. But as soon as you eat this, it's destroyed in your gut by a chemical called MAO. So it's hallucinogenic, but it's not going to do anything to you. It also contains, however, another substance which inhibits the chemical that breaks down the powerful hallucinogen. So neither of them is actually hallucinogenic in itself. It's how they work together that creates this amazingly weird mind shift. So the reductionist testing, you know, traditionally in science, we try to reduce things down to a silver bullet. So this plant appears to work in traditional use to treat headaches. Let's find the magic chemical in this that does it. Then we can ditch the plant and just synthesize the chemical, make lots of money, and be great. Um, the problem is, if you test this, you can't actually find anything that's actually working. <coughs> okay, the other reason I think, um, although, hang on one second. Although, okay, let's say there is, um, there is absolutely no evidence whatsoever for any of these plants, no, no scientific evidence. If people have been taking this stuff for about 5,000 years, well, actually 5,000 years in some medical systems, but the argument is we've been taking plant-based medicine since you know, we, were, we were chimps, effectively. Um, even if there was no science behind it, still people were still taking it then. So why, why would they doubt it? If this stuff really worked, people wouldn't need a trial to tell it would work. They would just know that if you take it, your, your headache goes away. Um, I thought I would give you an example of basically we've lost a lot of this knowledge so as we haven't been testing it out, if you don't take an aspirin pill and someone then tells you aspirin pills don't work, you're quite, it's quite easy to believe them if you've never taken them before. And I would give you an example basically of how we've lost all this traditional knowledge. It sounds quite tricky to believe when you explain it in the context of the UK, but I'm going to explain it in the context of Ecuador, which makes it a little bit more dramatic and I think easy to understand. It's basically what I was studying in my master's thesis, right? So I went to Ecuador, um, I was living there prior to when I was studying, and I thought it was fascinating because you go to these herbal markets and you have these you know, people covered in feathers and all kinds of weird exoticness, and what they're selling, you go up, you have a little look at what they're selling, you realize it's nettles, it's dandelion, it's black leaves, it's um, oh, uh, horse tail, it's really daisies, uh, not particularly exotic English hedgerow kind of species. And I wanted to go and figure out why this guy covered in feathers that's telling me that his medicine was handed down to him from his Incan forefathers is selling me daisies. Um, so I wanted to figure it out. And basically what I discovered is, it's traditional medicine there. 90% of the time, for 95% of the illnesses, they use introduced European species in the highland cloud forest of remotest northern Ecuador. What's going on there? And basically what you find is, almost like um, the Amish speak 17th century Dutch, you have 15th or whichever century Spanish traditional medicine living on in indigenous people that don't have that much Spanish blood or Spanish culture, they even speak their own indigenous language, a lot of them don't even speak Spanish, in these kind of rare remote areas, what's going on there? So I try to figure it out, basically there's a combination of factors that creates this. When the Spanish went over, uh, in a, within a very few years there was a 70% depopulation, which is a very polite way of saying that about 30% of the population survived the original population after about 50 years of the Spanish being there. Not only because a lot of them were killed directly, uh, a lot of them got introduced diseases and you just had this, in some areas up to 90% of the population was wiped out. It was believed that the Amazon was actually quite densely populated to the point that they were, they were about to form their own states like Europe would have, your own countries. Um, and the reason why it's empty now is not because it's never been filled, it's because it was filled and it would die. Um, so you get about 70% of people being wiped out. What happens then is you lose your knowledge base. Just imagine if 70% of the UK lost it, the population suddenly wiped out. That's a lot of doctors and university professors and a lot of the part of the, you know, the conventional medicine fraternity disappear to pass on their medicine. The other thing you get is desertification. The Spanish arrive, they cut down all the forests, they introduced a lot of um, sort of uh, animals like sheep and cattle, and you get this major desertification. Where I was working, the climate was just like Spain, but the original climate would have been a bit like Cornwall, like sort of cool, wet, almost temperate rainforest. And you go to the little 
uh, cracks where you can't get, you know, sheep can't quite get to. You have this amazing, almost 